All right, well, good morning, everyone. If you are new here to the church, you may be a little behind in our sermon series, but basically we've been traveling through Romans, and we've all sat under some pretty heavy sermons in the last while. We've been sitting down hearing about the the reality of sin and judgment and righteousness and so many other things. We've been talking about Romans 13. We've been talking about church and state. We've hammered out the reality of those things. And then last week, we started opening up with this issue issue of the principle of conscience and that is a very heavy topic and last week I pretty much preached on what needs to be preached on this morning in relation to the text that was just read over us and so my purpose this morning is to continue on and piggyback on what we spoke about last week as Chris read the text we can tell very clearly that what is taking place is the Apostle Paul is summarizing his thoughts he is basically repeating what he has already said and he's bringing it all together regarding the very serious issue between dietary issues and date issues with the Gentiles and the Jews coming together in this first century context and how to work around these issues. And so as we're going to piggyback again off this morning, I want to talk to you quickly about a, a subject that we don't like to talk about, and that is basically what verse 13 and 14 open up with, and that is opinions. Now in order to do so, I want to ask you a question. Who here studies war? World War II, World War I. If you do, yep, I love war history. I love Canadian history specifically. Now if you're not familiar with World War II, it's quite a while ago, but there was an individual by the name of Rommel, Field Marshal Rommel. He was a German. He was part of the German army, and he was responsible for ensuring that the beachheads in Europe, so along Normandy, along the coast, were basically almost impossible to invade because everyone knew during the war that it was only a matter of time before the Allied invasion was going to take place in Europe. And so what Rommel came up with in, in this beachhead before June, uh, June 6, 1944 were these, uh, these things, excuse me, called hedgehogs. Now hedgehogs were these big X frames, if you know, you might have seen them. They're made out of cast, like this, excuse me, not cast iron. They're made out of be- iron beams and they sat inside the water. When the tide come up, you could hardly see them. When the tide was down, they became visible. Now what a hedgehog was though, it was an obstacle. The hedgehog was an obstacle, and these obstacles had a design to stop tanks. But not just to completely stop a tank, but also to impair the movement of any vehicles. And the way they would impair is that if they weren't, if, you know, if the water's above that line, they could tear into the vehicle. They could tear into what is trying to move past those things. So think about that for a moment. Think about that analogy of the hedgehog, which is an object or it's an obstacle in the way that would either stop or impair movement. Because that is exactly what an obstacle is. That's exactly what an obstacle definition is. If you look in the dictionary, it is something that can hinder the progress of movement. And it's important for us to understand why this is happening in our text because Paul is now teaching us more uh, principles regarding the issue of our opinions. You see, again, the hedgehogs, as I stated, were designed to rip and to tear and to cause something to be held back. Now, if you look at the Greek word for obstacle for a moment, you get that word uh, prosma or prosmoa. And this word for prosoma, it translates to stumbling. Stumbling over something. And so when when you read scripture and it talks about do not become a stumbling block or an obstacle, we can't always assume it means the same thing. Because there are times when it means to strike your foot against. in In that term. To strike your foot against and this stumbling block could be a large boulder. It could be something that could cause you to either have to walk around, to have to jump over, something that is causing you to have an obstacle. But there is another reference for stumbling block or or obstacle, and we have to be careful in our terms here because it means that something that can simply be sticking up out of the ground. It could be a stick. It could be a pebble. It could be something else, but that word is scandalon. 
Scandalon is different because it's talking about a different issue altogether. And so what might happen is somebody could be walking along a pathway, and it might not be a big boulder, but they could kind of walk and do one of those, and they can trip. So why am I sharing this? Because Chris just read for us a very important text. And what we're understanding then is that we are called as people, don't forget last week's sermon, to hold to the foundations of the Christian faith. We are to be bold dogmatic over tier one um, theology. We do not mess around with certain aspects of Christianity, but then there's also the second and the third. But what we do in our Christianity, in our opinions, sometimes in our lack of knowledge, we make stumbling blocks or obstacles obstacles where they should not be. And the problem with this is because what the apostle is driving at is that it is an absolute sin for an individual to either prevent someone from pursuing righteousness or acting in such a way that would cause them to sin. That's the stumbling blocks. This is the obstacles that we're talking about. You and me as believers, we have to be very careful when we are choosing to make a law where there is no law. And in your actions, in your theology, in how you talk to one another, if you are preventing a brother or sister for pursuing Christ and pursuing righteousness and being all in for God by your opinion, that is a sin. At the same time, if you are so laid back and relaxed and you are basically allowing a brother or sister to go into an area of sin and by your conduct you are promoting sin, that is also a huge problem. We don't want to be these individuals. Now, remember the hedgehog. Remember those things. Remember the big obstacles. And also remember those little sticks that stick out of the ground. Why? Because in Christianity, often we cause our brothers and sisters to stumble because of our own false sense of humility. It is our own false sense of humility. We are fake, humble people. And what we try to do is give a persona about ourselves that doesn't exist. We want to show that we're humble. We act like we're humble. Hey, some of us even wrote a book about 46 chapters on how we have established being perfectly humble. And it's on Amazon so you can learn to be just as humble as I am. But false humility can be a stumbling block. And it can trip people up. Another thing we must understand is many Christians are self-righteous. Now this doesn't negate all the truth that we've been preaching for over a year since Romans 1.1. But many people and many Christians are self-righteous. And what that means is that you operate, you act in a certain way. And because you're at a certain level in your walk, you will look at another individual and you will base their salvation based upon your self-righteousness. That is a stumbling block. Many are legalistic. We don't have to go that too far, do we? They make a law where there is no law. And many Christians are overly opinionated. These are issues that Paul is driving at. The core of the argument, what we went through last week, was regarding meat and diet. Sorry, diet and days, excuse me. But again, in Christianity... Over 2,000 years now, we have made many laws where there is no law. We have placed upon our opinions, and we've even placed burdens upon other people that do not belong there. We were going through our pre-service devotions in the back, and we were talking about the Pharisees putting burdens and weight upon the people so that they can worship and follow God, and those weights and burdens never should have been there. And in Matthew 11, 28 down to the end, Jesus says, my burden is light. And so the problem that we do oftentimes in Christianity, we become that Pharisee. We put burdens on another human being because God may have convicted you that a certain action is not right. Maybe God has convicted you that you need to do a certain thing, but you take that conviction, and then what you do is you hammer another brother or sister saying they must live in accordance to that conviction. And if they don't live into that conviction, what do we do as Christians? That person's not saved. But we are reformed in our doctrine, justification by faith alone. And it's important. So these are stumbling blocks. 
And so this is why we're talking about the principles of Christian liberty. Christian liberty is highly, highly important for us to understand. So I'm going to go a little bit of last week's sermon into my introduction here because we need to really understand what I was saying because I'm not condoning someone to act a certain way and simply be antinomian. But what I'm trying to push here and so that we understand is that the text is giving us a beautiful, beautiful representation of how we can live. Remember what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10.23. He says, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. That is huge. The reference, of course, is meat and food in the context of that was offered to idols. And we understand it's about the opinions of those individuals to, to partake in such things. But I want to go back to last week. Because I've got a good bit of feedback off the sermon. Pastor Steve, are you saying that we can start drinking at a, as Christians in a church? If that's what you got from my sermon last week, I didn't do my job well. So let me backtrack. Let's ask the question. What about alcohol? What about cigars? What about Christmas and Easter? What about these things in regards to Christian liberty? Because this is the new meat being offered to idols. This is our context, contextualization here, right? We're not arguing about Jews and Gentiles coming together in a church because most of us, pretty much all of us, are all Gentiles. But our issue is these, it, these things that maybe a Presbyterian feels that is okay. Maybe somebody in a Pentecostal church thinks it's okay. And we have this idea in our head to what is truly white, right and what is wrong. So is alcohol and the consumption of alcohol when you see a person doing profess christ does that mean they are not saved some people will say yeah if you drink alcohol you're like the world you're showing worldly fruits you're not saved the answer though is no no is drinking alcohol a sin perhaps to some of you it is to others it is not So let's just talk about this for a second, because we want to make sure we're fighting the right fight. Is alcohol addictive? Absolutely. Will alcohol destroy your life? Absolutely. If you are an alcoholic, is it killing your body? Absolutely. Does alcohol lead to sin? Absolutely, 100%. Does the scriptures prohibit the consuming of alcohol? No. That's something we have to deal with. So we as Christians cannot look at someone who's drinking and say, that guy's not saved. Hey, listen, pastor, I want to tell you something. Shirley, hopefully nobody named Shirley here. Because Shirley was in the bar last week. There's no way she's a Christian. She needs to be removed from the, from the hospitality committee because she might be spiking our egg with rum. We can't do that. Because in 1 Timothy 5.23, we learn that Paul's young apprentice was told to drink wine for his stomach's sake. Now, I'm a Baptist, so all my Baptist friends in the room, hold on, Pastor. The word for wine's not actually translated wine. It's more like grape juice. It was a very slightly fermented grape juice. No, no, it's not. Actually, a history lesson. Did you know Welch's grape juice was invented by a Baptist because they didn't want to take wine during communion? True. But the same word translated for wine is the same reference at the feast, the wedding. Many people serve the, the good wine, right? You buy your Jackson Triggs, I don't know. And then when they have enough to drink, or basically when they're so hammered that they don't know if they're drinking water or wine, they serve the garbage. But you have served the best wine now. Has anyone ever gone to a Jewish wedding? Well, I'm the, right? It's a party. It is a party and it keeps on going. It was the same in the old, temp- uh, the old uh, ancient world. So what we're learning though from the text, it's not the issue of alcohol itself. What Paul is getting at here and how we can apply it is don't do something around a weaker vessel so that you are going to cause them to sin. If you are a Christian who thinks that consuming alcohol is wise, and many alcoholics will tell you it started with a glass back in the day, don't be doing it around another Christian who is weak in that area. 
Can you imagine consuming alcohol from, and going, okay, come over to my house. And they'll say, Tony, he's not, by the way, he's not, 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 not. Don't confuse this, not. But let's just say Tony was an alcoholic. Not. And he comes over to my house. I'm like, hey, Tony, I'm so glad that Jesus saved you, man. You want some Johnny Walker? What kind of pastor would I be? What kind of elder would I be? What kind of Christian would I be to offer this man poison and he knows it's wrong? Again, the issue is not is it a sin or is it not a sin? We have to remember this. John Piper says it best. Stop asking if it's a sin and start asking does it help me run? So alcohol is not a matter of somebody being saved or not. Does it help an individual to walk a sanctified life and walk a life that is fully devoted to Jesus Christ and not impairing their mind and not impairing their faculties so that they can actually function in the service of Christ? Here's another history lesson. Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, they all drank wine. And if we get too legalistic, here's another history lesson. Martin Luther was known to craft some of the best beer during the Reformation. Martin Luther. I'm not telling you to drink. That would be irresponsible of me. I think consuming alcohol is wrong. I think abstaining is smart. I do. But there's nothing wrong with a glass of wine. There's nothing wrong with having a beer if your conscience tells you so. If your conscience tells you so. But you better not dare put your lips up to that if your conscience tells you not to. And you better use wisdom because there's an old song by Charlie Daniels. Every country singer has a gospel album. But one of the things he says in his song, he's passed away, is what makes a man drink, take a drink from a bottle when he knows it will cut like a knife? And he's basically saying you better be very careful because you're messing with things. And addiction always starts with one simple sip. So as your pastor, I am not saying you can drink alcohol. I am not saying you should drink alcohol. I am not promoting the use of alcohol. But what I am saying is, if you are looking at another human being who professes Jesus Christ, who might take wine in their communion or have a red wine with their steak and say there's no way that person is is saved you are now the one in sin because it's justification by faith alone it's not upon your opinion of what a person can and cannot do in christ is that point clear because i did not make that point last week clear awesome let's go to the second one that i touched on last week smoking smoking does it send somebody to hell If you were to walk out of a church and see an individual having a cigarette, is that person saved or not? Now, many of you might go, well, there's no way the Holy Spirit resides in that person. There's no way. How can they put that up against their lips? There's no way he's got the conviction or she's got the conviction. I certainly would. They're not even saved. Well, hold on a second. Is smoking addictive? Absolutely. Lung cancer? Absolutely. Did you know R.C. Sproul smoked? Did you know he smoked heavily? Do you know that's why he died? He had OPCD or OCPD or LMNOP. Whatever hits your lungs, I'm not a doctor. Thank you. I don't want to diminish the disease. But that's why he died. Was it wise to smoke? Not at all. Did you know a lot of the authors on your bookshelf, those great men of Reformed theology and some of the older ones, you know they smoked pipes. Do you all listen or watch or, yeah, watch. Do you all read our, um, C.S. Lewis? How many people are Tolkien fans? I don't say there's salvation one way or the other, but they smoke pipes. Is it wrong? Is it dangerous? I'm not saying one way or the other, but my point is this. Don't call somebody saved or unsaved based upon what you understand about that issue. Smoking is addictive. It kills you. Yes, we are the body of like the temple of the spirit. We should be able to walk around and show that he who dwells in us, the one who has the power to raise Christ from the grave, certainly has the power to break every bondage of addiction, either smoking, drinking, porn, anger, gluttony, everything else. That is all true. But it does not mean if a brother or sister is doing that, they are not saved. This is why we have to be careful in our terminology because if we make a law where there is no law and if we're calling somebody saved or unsaved we are in big trouble I'm going to take it even further Christmas 
and Easter. There are many people, don't be offended by this, there are many people who say, I will not celebrate Christmas because it's all pagan. You know, but when's this last week, right? It's all pagan. The Yule log, the ivy, the candy canes, the Christmas tree. And I went and did a little joke that we create little pagan gods in three round balls and put a hat on them. Listen, did you know as much as you may have an argument for that, there are many sound exegetical arguments that will show you that what people are saying on their YouTube channels are wrong and that Christmas has been celebrated in the church for long, long periods of time. Did you know that we could challenge the date of December 25th and say that it was brought by a Roman historian? And in fact, if you look at the dates, Jesus was probably born in October. That is a statement, and that is truth that you could build up to. But as much as that's true, did you also know patristic and ancient teachings of the Christian church actually taught that when you look at the birth date of the, uh, John the Baptist, which kind of rounds up around mid-June, is actually when the days start getting shorter, and Jesus being born around December is when the days start getting longer, I must decrease, he must increase. They had all these ideas of theology that was going around. So if you, if you don't celebrate Christmas because you think those who are celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ, God veiled in human flesh, and you think that those who set up the tree and those who come along and have family gatherings clearly can't be Christian because they're celebrating Roman Catholic idolatry, you're the one in sin. You're in sin because you're placing your opinion and the matters of your conscience on that individual. But the same way, if you're like, you're going to come over to my house and you know somebody who doesn't like Christmas and you're going to lay holy hands on them, sit by the tree, watch Charlie Brown Christmas and enjoy the Yule log. I will beat this pagan out of you. You're also in sin. And so if you're sitting there, and let's put it all together, and you feel that you are feel led to have a couple of Christians come over to your house at Christmas time and eat some ham and have a cigar and a nice glass of wine, and somebody says, I am against all of that, don't force them to go. And at the same time, don't be on the other side either. And here's why I say this. What about head coverings? What about head coverings, guys? Gals, come on. What about them? I know so many women who wear head coverings. And when they walk around and see a sister not wearing a head covering, they brutalize them and look down upon them as if the sister who doesn't have her head covered is some kind of harlot. And they, oh, look at you. Is your husband not your head? Are you going to cause all these brothers to lust after you? Put a head covering on. And they bind the conscience of another Christian. They bind it. It's not right. What about plain clothing? There are some who cannot walk into a church and deal with the fact that somebody showed up in a jeans and t-shirt. I would love to preach in jeans and t-shirts. I don't. Do you know why I dress like this? Not because I'm better. Not because I think that all of a sudden I have something better than everyone else. I dress like this because in the world that we have now, I find that if I don't dress the part, I don't put my uniform on as it were, much of the stuff that I am saying is going to be discredited because many of the false teachers and many of those you know, skinny jean wearing hip hopsters are going out there preaching a false gospel when somebody tunes into our message, they're going to look, look, he's just another one of them. So I try to stand out, not because I think it makes me a better Christian, it's because the message is so important. But there are people who will walk into a church and judge the way you're dressed. I'm, I'm just going to keep preaching. we got nowhere to go. It's Sunday. It's the Lord's Day. Fact. Many kids, many kids, including some of my own, have a hard time going to church because when they walked into a church, there was a man and a lady in a suit and a hat, which is nothing wrong with wearing that, looked down upon them, judged them, said things to them that they felt so unloved that they're like, if that is the church of Jesus Christ, I want nothing to do with it. 
There's nothing wrong with wearing a hat and a dress. Ladies, I think you look beautiful when you wear your dresses and your hats. And men, I think you look handsome. I can say both things are true when you put yourself together. But we got to remember when we make a law where there is no law, we become hedgehogs to other people who are trying to work out their faith. It cannot happen. And I'm just going to get some people mad. I do every sermon. And one of the most saddest things in Christianity is when you have a 600-pound man or a 300-pound guy who can't even keep his pants up, on a, can't even get up a set of stairs, and walks to a pulpit and ridicules every single believer in the church that they need to start living holy and righteous and put away the filth and all this stuff. And everyone's looking at him saying, dude, you need to learn to put away the buffet. It's just a different sin. He might not be convicted about eating 14 helpings at the Mandarin. You might. Christian liberty is serious. It is very serious. It is so important that we love one another, church. You know we preach hard here. You know we preach hard. But today's not the day. And the problem that we must remember is that if we go too far this way, legalism. If we go too far this way, antinomian. We need balance. We need balance. So understanding that, we have to ask the question, are we making a law where there is no law? Let me go into our first portion of Romans 14 this morning. I just want to read verse 13. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. Now you know why I gave that in my intro about the hedgehog. So you connect this statement here and come back to these concluding thoughts. When Paul says, therefore, therefore, this is what's going on. Therefore, let us not judge. What he's doing is all that he's been talking about which we've covered in the last couple weeks, he comes here now and says, by the way, let's wrap this up. You know when you hear Pastor Steve say, let's wrap this up, and you get excited? That's what's happening here. Let's wrap this up. And all of a sudden he goes, this issue of judging one another. We talked about this last week. There's different types of judgment. We don't need to unpack that again. But now we have this anacrino. This type of judgment, it's once again saying basically that we're coming in to give that critical scrutinizing, right? Like I'm being very critical of my brother or sister, and my criticism and my judgment is is, is cutting sharp, it's cutting deep. And Paul's giving us a caution here, and he's saying that when we come, therefore let us not critique or scrutinize one another anymore, but determine this not to put those stumbling blocks in a brother or sister's way. Now, don't get me wrong. There are things that we need to fight about in case I get charged again with going too far. Let me just be very clear. We will be dogmatic, or as Steve Lawson says, we will be bold dogmatic on the important issues of Christianity. We will judge, we will critique, we will scrutinize, and if you're me, you'll put it out on Twitter and write a blog about it. But we will absolutely scream from the rooftops and challenge our brothers and sisters who profess Christ if they wander away from the doctrine of the Trinity. There's no, you don't mess around with the Trinity. This is not what Paul's talking about. But I'm just going to sidebar here. If somebody starts tampering or messing around with the Trinity, which means that there is only one God. God is one in essence, three in persons. When they go a wrong way and they start going into all kinds of issues with the Trinity, we will scream and we will say this is wrong. If a Christian decides to attack the deity of Jesus Christ, we will speak up. Absolutely. Actually, let's just turn to 1 John for a second. 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. If you're not familiar with your Bible, go to Revelation, Jude, 3 John, 2 John, 1 John. In 1 John... Chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. It says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. 
And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that is coming and now is already in the world. You are from God, little children. You have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. I read verse 4 because it encourages me. But we are certain on the deity of Christ. Jesus Christ, God veiled in human flesh. Truly God, truly man. And since he is the God man, since he is the true and proper object of our faith, we do not allow somebody to tamper with that doctrine. It's no longer about opinions here. It's no longer about hedgehogs. We're talking about landmines, nuclear bombs going off. We're going to go in and we're going to fight the fight of doctrinal purity. If somebody was to start challenging that salvation is not by grace alone, we will most certainly challenge that because we know in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, that we know that our, our salvation is a gift from God, right? I hope so. If not, we're going to turn right now and read it. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. Ephesians after Galatians, right? <laughs> Just kidding. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And it's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not a result of works that no one should boast. Grace. So if somebody says, yeah, you're saved by grace and faith, but saved by grace and faith, if faith and grace also, they will be dealt with lovingly. We're not going to burn them at the stake. We've gone past that. But we will deal with it. The resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. If somebody denies the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, we will absolutely be bold dogmatic about that. Why would we do that? Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 14 through 17, it says this. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith is in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we witness against God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are, I'm going to keep going, for the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, since you are still in your sins. So if somebody is challenging, excuse me, the doctrine of resurrection, we will be bulldog at them. We will come at them with everything that we've got, and we'll say, no, this is not an opinion. You are walking the road of apostasy and potential heresy. Same with the doctrine of the gospel. Do not forget what the Apostle Paul tells us. If anyone comes to you preaching a different gospel, they are anathema, accursed. So we fight that. We also know where the gospel is in the same chapter, 1 Corinthians 15 through 1 and 4. We understand that Jesus Christ came, that he walked among us, that he was crucified, he was raised on the third day in accordance to the scriptures. So the gospel that we preach, if somebody says the gospel and Jesus died simply for love, if they start preaching the the heretical nonsense that was coming out of the meeting house with our brother Bruxy when he was denying penal substitutionary atonement, when the gospel coalition was even giving them Bruxy an avenue of praise and saying this man is safe even though he denies penal substitution, we as Christians say hold on a second, we're going to hold you accountable to that. This guy is denying a core doctrine of the gospel. He's denying soteriology. He is denying ordo salutis. He is going off the rails. Why are you holding on? We will fight even if the whole world wants to stay in their beds and sleep as the church continues to slip further further into apostasy. We're not going to mess with that because Titus 1.9 tells us that we are to hold on to sound doctrine, and refute those who contradict it. But saying that, those are the majors. Those are the majors that we need to be focusing on this, in, our, in our Christian walk. Not the Christmas trees. Not the Heinekens and the Budweiser's. Not if some Christian you know, feels it's okay to show up in his church wearing his ripped jeans and his t-shirt. Not if somebody thinks that country gospel music sung by Alan Jackson is good and you think, no, it's completely wrong. No, those, we don't have time for those fights. Those are matters of opinion. 
Going now back to Romans 14, verse 14. I know and I am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. The Apostle Paul already anticipates the objections that are going to come at him with the audience who were the first recipients of this letter. And what Paul is saying is, guys, listen, justification is beyond just meets and days. What is your conscience saying? What is your conscience saying between you and the Holy Spirit right now, my brothers and sisters in this room and online, what is your conscience saying that you can and cannot do? Is it clear in what you are doing? Because if it's not and it's convicting you and the Spirit is telling you that what you're doing is wrong, you best be yielding to that Spirit. Him, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Again, Remember what John 8, 36 says, the son who the son sets free is free indeed. Christians have liberty. We don't have liberty to sin. We don't have liberties to walk in all kinds of ungodliness and filthiness. No, Galatians 5 tells us very clearly that we are not to be operating in the works of the flesh. We are called to be walking in the spirit. But what this is getting at as well is that we are not bound to observe the ceremonial law. We talked about this this morning. The Mosaic Covenant was a marriage covenant between the Socratic people of Israel and Yahweh. That was put in place so that they would walk in a certain way in that marriage relationship between them and God. But we also know that the prophets told us that the time is coming and we hear about the divorce between God and Israel because their waywardness and their sin and everything else. But the prophets say, behold, I am making a new covenant. And he tells us that he is the one that's going to take the stone of of, of the heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. He is the one who's going to call us as people who are never his people. He is the one who's going to establish that relationship. This is why Jesus is the bridegroom and we are the bride because we are married to him in the new covenant. And that means then you're free. You're free. You're free to be a Baptist. You're free to be a Presbyterian. And that's really as far as I want to go because I don't really trust any other denomination. But you're free. But you are free. You're free to go home tonight and eat lobster and a big chunk of juicy ham. And for some of you, if you decide to have a beer with it, you are free to do so. Just because I may not agree with you, I don't get to judge you. I don't get to critique you. And I don't get to be like an arrogant, selfish pope in Rome to declare you saved or unsaved based upon your conscience. That's what this is getting at. It's huge. I'm not saying to be antinomian. And then he carries the thought even more. Verse 15, we're almost done. For because of your food, excuse me, For if because of your food, your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Love one another. Seriously. If you're going to have a Jewish person visit your house, don't cook ham. And if one of you is a vegetarian, and I'm not, I like to kill it, watch it fat drip in that glorious grill. When I drive by a cow field, I don't think, oh, what a beautiful creation that God made. No, no, I'm like, wow, steak. Christy, we got to have steak tonight. That's me. But if you're going to come over to my house and you're a vegetarian, I'm not going to serve it to you because I love you. We're going to have salad. Yummy, boring salad. (laughs) If I'm winning a Muslim to Christ... I'm not, or a Muslim who just came to Christ, excuse me, I'm not going to serve him pork. Hey, smarten up. You were a Muslim yesterday, tell you you're a Christian, eat the pork chop. I'm not going to do that. Why? Because of love. I'm not going to cause you grief. I don't want to cause you grief. I want to respect you that you may not be in your same area of sanctification in your walk that I'm in. You may be convicted of certain things that I'm not convicted to. And I don't want to push my burden upon you. Now, my job's to preach hard. My job's to call it sin, and I will. But if, you, if you're not familiar with this church, you know one thing is true. This is why I encourage everybody online to be here. We don't mess around on Sundays. 
But if you want to know who I am, you've got to be here during the week. Because I'm a pretty relaxed guy. And I hope you're relaxed with your brothers and sisters as well. So remember the term that Paul's basically getting at. If it hurts somebody to do something, don't do it. Abstain. Love them. When something's done around, something is done around a weaker vessel that hinders them, walk in grace. If somebody has a weaker conscience, then prefer that conscience. Stop that activity. Why would we want to injure somebody else's conscience? Why would we want to do that? My desire is that you would soar with Christ. My desire is that you would just run after him with everything that you have. But I'm not the Holy Spirit. I can tell you which way you should go, but it's up to you. You know, I can't stand veggie tails. I hate them. I really, that stupid tomato. I mean, maybe I should become a vegetarian so I make a fruit salad. But, sorry Bob, Bob the tomato. But here's the thing. They said something in their uh, episode years ago when I was still dealing with a lot of young kids called the snoodle's tail. And one of the things that this guy said is, blah, 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 little poem, but the, it goes, a love worth demanding is no love at all. A love worth demanding is no love at all. And if we as Christians feel that we have to demand somebody walk a certain way to show that you love God, that's not truly loving God. I don't want to consume alcohol because I love Jesus Christ. I love him. He saved me from a world of alcoholism. He saved me from fist fights and he saved me from falling over drunk and down the stairs. Why do I want to go back to that? I love Jesus. I love him so much. I don't want to smoke cigars because I have the liberty to do so. But if that's where you're at, I love you enough to say, okay, no worries. In time, if God convicts you, you will drop that. And I, that's, that's what I'm trying to get at. So, Let's go 17 and 19 and get out of here because we have communion and a bunch of awesome announcements today. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. There it is. Paul's already exegeted my entire sermon. Righteousness and joy. Pursue the things that are pleasing to God. Do the things that lift up the body of Christ. Love each other, guys. Let's fight the fight of faith, but let's put down the non-issues, the non-essentials. Let's not tear down each other because in every one of us, the work of God is being manifested. Every one of us is being sanctified bit by bit by bit. Some of you can't love God because you never had a dad that loved you. Some of you can't love your sisters in Christ because maybe you have mom issues. Maybe some of you have come from a very bad divorce and you, Jesus saved you from your sin after your whole life was messed up and you have trust issues. Maybe you don't trust brothers. Maybe you don't trust sisters. And maybe when you're here, maybe things are going on, but it doesn't mean you're not saved. It just means God is working on you slowly and surely and together we build each other up in this liberty. And so in your Christian conscience, in that Christian liberty, we don't bring you down. We don't tear you apart. We don't say things that are not edifying but we help each other. Anyway, I talked a lot about it in the last sermon. We've got to wrap this up. Let's just do verses 22 to 23 because I, I, I'm a little bit over on my timing here. The faith which you have, you have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves, but he doubts in condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith and whatever is not from faith is sin powerful powerful you know a cheap illustration actually is not my notes but if you ever go to a like one of those pentecostal churches and like you know like you know they raise hands and flag and stuff like that and you feel so out of place and inside you just feel like you want to run but you decide you're going to raise hands and do the flag and you're like i'm such a sinner that's kind of a really good example of what this is getting at you do something that goes straight against the very core of your conscience. This is why Martin Luther even said, to go against conscience is neither safe or proper. That's what the, basically it's getting at. And what it's saying is it's not our standard. If you find that you're worshiping God because somebody told you to worship, like this is not discipleship, right? We're not talking about strange fire. You come in, pastor, I'm going to offer strange fire. I'm like, yeah, good, man, Christian liberty. No, we already talked about that with those last week and what I just said about the hard things. But if you're at a church and you worship only because your brothers and sisters are looking at you, 
and you're worshiping in a certain way or you're acting a certain way or doing things a certain way because you want to be like that even though your conscience is screaming against you, you are the one in sin, not them. Not our standards, but remember what the text says, that all are accountable to Christ. All of us. Every one of you. What you eat, what you drink, what you say, what you teach, what you let other Christians see about you. Your neighbors who don't know Jesus Christ, the way you maybe yell in your home, do you slam doors? Do they see you bringing more beer in and more empties out on a Saturday night? Hey, you can do, hey, I've clearly laid the groundwork, but you will be accountable. You will. The money that God gives you and the resources that he tells us that we are to be cheerful givers, to give of the first fruits, where's it going? Smokes, beer, lottery tickets, where's it going? You will be accountable for everything, every word, every cent, every action, every opinion. But at the same time, we don't want to just be people filling our heads with information and causing people to trip. We want true transformation. Christ indeed gives us liberty, but that liberty is a matter of deep, deep conscience. Deep. So what do we do? How do we take this home? Because there's a lot to take, isn't there? If anybody says, Steve said I could go to the keg and have a couple pints, that's not the point of the sermon. But to take this home, we need to remember as believers, we need to be approachable. And being people who are approachable, we are certainly not the hedgehogs that were used during the war. That means we can be accountable to one another and we can talk to one another about where we are in our Christian walks and we don't have to worry about another saint ripping our bellies open with legalism or opinions. But they lead us into the word of God and they cause us to consider our actions and what we find permissible. We don't want to be people who prevent people from pursuing righteousness. If you do that, you're in sin. But at the same time, you don't want somebody to be pushed off into the area of sin. If anything, it tells us very clearly that we should very, very much watch what we say and what we do at all times. We do not want to be that boulder or that stick along the path that somebody's going to trip over. Do you have that reputation? You know that, that one person that's like, I really need help with my walk, I should go talk to so-and-so. They're like, no, don't talk to that person. They'll just make me feel bad. They'll rip me down. They'll destroy me. I don't feel like I've been... I, I've encountered a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ. I just felt like I just, I'm a loser, I'm a failure, I'm everything else. We don't want to be that person. No. We don't want to be overly consumed with what's in your life. Let's start focusing on our own walks, guys. You know, Jesus said the best. Why are you worrying about the, the speck in your brother's eye when you got a log in your own? Why are you worried about if John Boy wants to have a Budweiser when you're sitting there on like, you know, 14 different pills for blood pressure because you can't say no to something else? Why are we worried about the one translation your sister or brother has when we don't even read our own? Why are we worried about the person in a suit and tie when we can't even get to church half the time? Why? Let's fight the real fight. Let's fight the attacks against doctrine in the Christian church. Let's attack the state overstepping its authority. Let's attack the apostasy and the heresy that's rising up with Bethel and Hillsong. And let's start putting you know, our efforts into these things because that's where it counts. We don't want to be overly consumed. The Holy Spirit loves them, and he loves us. And if you're being convicted by the Holy Spirit, then trust that the Holy Spirit's going to convict somebody else. You are not the Holy Spirit. Stop being him, because you can't be him. Now, that's not to say don't be lazy. Scripture tells us we are to go to our brothers and sisters. It tells us to leave our gift at the altar. It tells us to combat sin. All that's true. Remember, one truth of Scripture doesn't negate the other. It's balance. So what I'm saying today doesn't negate since September 2021, okay? So go back and listen to the entire sermon series if this is confusing. But love each other, disciple each other, encourage each other, rebuke each other, and always, 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 when you do this, do it in absolute prayer, and you better have shed some tears over that person before you place your opinion on them and cause them to stumble when Christ himself does not condemn them. 